Welcome, beautiful friends, to the Way of Mastery Deepening Lesson Number Dos. How many people are actually working with the Way of Mastery at home? Ooh, beautiful. Wow, this really is a deepening experience. As you probably found, there's that great excitement to go from one lesson to another because they're saying such beautiful things. You know, your soul gets really excited. It wants more, it wants more, it wants more. But of course, that's also a trick of the mind to move you along so you won't look deeper because there's so much depth to these lessons, so much beautiful depth. So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're on the second half, and we didn't even get to half. We're maybe a quarter of the way through deepening lesson number two. So you don't have to believe a word I say. Please don't. I mean, don't not mine or anybody's beliefs. Don't just adopt somebody's beliefs because they say it with a smile on their face or they say it really seriously or anything else. You have a hard enough time overcoming the beliefs that you already have. This is about letting go of beliefs, not adopting new ones. So you don't have to believe anything I say. If you like what I have to say, great. If it resonates deep within and your inner guide says yes, then work with it. If not, leave it aside. Don't let the mind just pick up a bone to chew on an objection and leave out a bunch of other really good stuff. Take what's helpful and use it. And what's not helpful, don't worry about it. It'll always be there when you're ready for it. Cindy and I were talking about this, that there are sometimes, you know, these text, these lessons are really deep, and we read it one time, and we go back and read it a second time, and we're like, wow, I don't even remember that the first time. It just, you know, your, your level of consciousness was such that, that that message was just too threatening, so it didn't get past the filter, and that's okay, but I'm going to try and peel back as many of those layers as we can today and get them in here, and of course, record them so you can always go back and watch them later. And if you miss something, it, there's always a chance. You know, awakening is a lot like a stew. It's on the back burner of the stove. Sometimes it just takes a while for it to be ready. It's not that, you know, it's bad. It's just not quite ready. So you're never going to lose anything. You can't lose it. But at some point, it'll move up to the front burner, and it'll be ready for you to enjoy it. That's just the way it works. It's kind of the pebble hitting the bottom of the pond. So... With that, we're going to make our way into the deepening of lesson number two, and we'll start with the Lord's Prayer. And I remember, thank you for reminding me, Yeshua, that to ask you when you do this to just really fo let your body just go completely limp and just put your awareness in your heart area, right behind this one eyeball. Put your attention there and just feel. Don't think, and if there is thinking, don't fight the thinking. Just put your awareness here and just feel. Avun the Boshmaya Nita Kadasha Shama Tete Malkuda Neve a city nach Akina the Boshmaya O Paraha. Howlan Lachman Zunkanan Yamana Boshwoklan Halpin Akna Daphanan Shwakin Il Hayabin Ula Talan Il Nisyan El Pasan Nim Bisha Mithad Lachim Al Kuta Uhaila Utish Bokta La Alam Amen. Amen. Halan 
is good stuff. Could you feel that? I mean, it, it's like a, a homing signal for your soul. You know, it resonates so deep within your being. It Just listening to this affects a partial alchemical transformation of your being. Because your soul, of course, wakes up to the resonance of the truth of that message. Because Yeshua didn't give us that prayer to pray to God. I mean, it, it, it's that way a little bit, but it was also reaffirming the prayer of the presence of God. And that's just so beautiful. So I'm glad you guys get to share it with us. You ready, Cindy? Oh, thank you, Joy. I appreciate that. Joy's going to hand out cards and pencils. If anyone has a question, please write it down. I'll get it at the end so we don't get caught in the middle because the Internet people can't hear the questions. Gordon will come around with the mics. Enjoy. Thanks for the reminder. Okay, here's the first one. The way of the heart, then, is not a way of gaining power. The way of the heart is not a way in which you will finally be able to make the world be what you want it to be. But rather, the way of the heart is that pathway in which you learn to transcend and to dissolve from your consciousness every perception, every thought, that is out of alignment with what is true. The thought of death is out of alignment. The thought of fear is out of alignment. The thought of guilt is out of alignment. The thought of eternal life is in alignment. The thought of perfect fearlessness is in alignment. The thought of peace is in alignment. The realization of innocence is in alignment. The thought of joy and forgiveness, these things are in alignment and reflect the truth that is true always. Thank you, Cindy. So the way of the heart is not a way of gaining power. I know I can feel it. And we went through those first lessons and he's saying, you are creating your reality. Of course, everyone is like, well, great. Then I'm going to create a different one. I'm going to create the one I want. It just depends on which eye is speaking. I don't know if you guys ever noticed, the little eye that has the, the stick and the ball above it, there's separation. In the big eye, it's all connected. There is no separation. So it's not a way of gaining power in the world as the ego would have it in terms of control of the... This is in terms of control of your mind on the level of Christ. And that is power can control all kinds of stuff. 
but we have to let go of all these perceptions that we have. Transcend them by dissolving them. Every perception, every thought, and everything that is out of alignment with what is true. If you guys remember back when we did the eraser exercise, you know this is part of learning to discern what's true and what's not. Thoughts of eternal life, well, those don't need to be erased. Those are okay. Thoughts of death, we need to erase those. So he's asking us to get conscious and be aware of what is starting to, what's going through our being. Now, before you guys picked up A Course in Miracles and actually, or some other pathway where you really started to question this whole concept of death, we rarely would have questioned that. We, we rarely would have raised to doubt the certainty of death because the, the skit around us is so compelling to tell us that that is indeed real, we would, really wouldn't question it. So he's given us this beautiful opportunity to continue with discernment and recognize that that's an important component of any spiritual pathway. And this, I love this line, the realization of innocence is in alignment. How many of you still struggle some with seeing guilt outside of yourself, seeing problems in the world? The degree to which you are willing to see or the degree to which you're unwilling to see innocence in someone else is the same degree to which you're unwilling to see innocence within yourself. You want to look at the world and all the problems? Those are only reflections to the same degree that you look within and determine problems. Now I'll try I point this out because the ego will will try and convince you that what's outside of you is a problem, but everything's hunky-dory inside. Don't get caught in that trap. If you're unwilling to see innocence in everyone and everything, then just admit to yourself, clearly I'm not willing to see innocence within. Let me take that to the Holy Spirit and we'll do some erasing work on that. But the, in the degree to which you're not willing to see freedom, that you want to see people's liberties restricted or whatever, that's the same degree to which you're unwilling to accept freedom within. So this is the tool that you use when you've thrown projection out there. It's like a fishing lure. What's really good is you can reel it back in. You can pull it all back in and bring it all back to its source and look within. So that's what he's asking us to do is begin that process of discernment and catching where we disassociate that there's guilt out there or problems out there but not within. If you spot it, you have to have it. If you spot it, you got it. If you're labeling it out there, you will and must label it within. So just look at where you're doing that. The more you're willing to see Christ out there, of course, the more you're willing to see Christ in here. And when you see nothing but that, inner and outer will disappear. This is what Jesus meant when he said, heaven and earth shall cease to exist. They'll cease to exist as separate states. There'll just be one experience happening. That's why I said it was spread over the face of the earth. Yet humanity sees it not. So how many of us have found this dissolving every perception, every thought that's out of alignment to be a wee bit challenging? Yeah, we're pretty clear about what we don't like, but trying to discern what's true versus what's not can get to be a pretty slippery slope. Because, you know, someone did something bad, someone, a body appeared to die, it's really easy to say that's true, that happened. But of course, that's completely out of alignment with eternal life. And any judgments and feelings and emotions that you have attached to that, you would only have if you believed that was real. So, have fun with your discerning and your ever-deepening enlightenment with the Spirit about what's true and what's not. And using your handy eraser. For you see, although you were given complete free will to create as you choose to, the soul begins to learn that that which brings it the highest joy, that which brings it the highest peace, and that, that which brings it the highest bliss imaginable is that which flows from the mind of God through the mind of the channel, the soul, 
and expresses itself in the field of experience. It is for this reason that your Father's will is that you be happy, and your happiness is found in choosing to restore your perfect alignment with only the voice for God. The way of the heart, then, is that pathway that begins with a commitment to healing and awakening and is founded on the premise, the axiom, that we have given unto you, that you are perfectly free at all times, and everything that is experienced has been by your choice, and at no time has there been any other cause. So how many of you would have believed that your whole life you have been a channel for God? That's what he's saying. He said it earlier in this lesson that we're always channeling something. Love or fear? And how well did we do fear? How well did we do body-mind? It had a divine origin. I mean, that's why we could pull it off so compellingly. We created it that way. So each and every one of us are channels. It's not a big deal. I mean, you know, if Yeshua wants to channel through you, he's certainly free to do that. But you're always channeling either your higher self or your lower self. It's got to be one or the other, love or fear. There are no other choices. Sometimes we get a little neurotic and we're like a, you know, we're back and forth, back and forth. You know, we channel love one moment and then fear. And so we hit fear and we bounce back over to love. And as soon as we've had love, fear jumps up and boop, 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 boop. You know, we go from sane to insane, you know, like a, what's a the thing that goes tick, 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 that keeps music up? Metronome. Yeah. Well, we want that thing dead stop right in the center on the truth. But I can assure you, based on being the channel for love, my own higher self, God self, Christ self, whatever, to do this work, I don't think there's a doubt in you guys' mind how joyful this is for me to do, how much fun this is to do. And this is just one expression. That same bliss, that same joy can be channeled into art or into digging ditches or into any expression. It doesn't have to look any way. You know, doing this and scrubbing toilets, there's no difference. One's not more holy than another. One's not sacred and the other one illusion. They're both absolutely equal and they're both neutral but the source having that love extend through you in what you do and you can do anything in a state of love just as you can do anything in a state of fear or anger and you are the one making that choice which is it going to be so it's the listen to the voice for god which will it be you've all heard the voice for god You've all heard it at times where you were absolutely distinct and really clear on it. And you also know the voice for the ego very clearly. But there's a, an area between the two that can be really narrow or it can seem to be really wide where you're not quite sure which one's which. But if you use this indication of happiness, that's a pretty good indication. He said it in A Course in Miracles. Do you want to be happy or do you want to be right? The ego usually is happy if it believes it's right. Happiness is an effect with an egoic consciousness. Happiness is cause, state of being within Christ consciousness. So just look, am I coming from happiness to go take my happiness to do whatever I'm doing or am I searching things to do that I think will bring me happiness. One, you're coming from the truth. One, you're coming from the illusion. You're coming from fullness if you're taking your happiness to do. You're coming from emptiness if you're trying to fill yourself by finding things that you think will make you happy. Remember, you're choosing all cause and effect anyway. So if you're looking for events to make you happy, you have determined what you're really saying is, I, as Christ, can't be happy unless certain events and situations and circumstances happen. And of course, that's categorically untrue. You can be happy regardless of situation or circumstance. 
And when you wake up from it, you recognize that all those events that we put all that kind of meaning on are all neutral anyway. So there's no reason to not be unhappy unless you're vested in believing what you're experiencing and are in resistance to it. So the way of the heart is this pathway which brings us to awakening. It starts us on the path. And of course the axiom, an axiom just means kind of a starting point for a logical argument. You know, Yeshua knows our mind so incredibly because we have a if this, then that mind in our duality, our, our logic tends to be linear. So he goes, great, if that's what you, how you think you think, I'll use that. I'll use your own logic to show you your own insanity. So he's telling us we're perfectly free at all times and that everything we're experiencing has been our choice. Does anyone in this room have conscious recognition of their decision to incarnate in this lifetime, in this time frame? Well, there, there's two subtleties here. One, we're being led to the choice of experience on the Christ mind level, which is where we eventually truly undo the level of separation because we have to get back to that level of mind where we made that decision. But we begin that work on our conscious egoic level that if I'm having this experience of upset, I had to have chosen it. I think someone else did something to me and I'm reacting to what they did, but there was a choice in there, but it happens so habitually and so fast and out of our awareness that we think it, that we didn't choose it. So he's given you the opportunity here to begin to recognize if you're willing to accept that you can't experience anything that you haven't chosen. If you're angry, it could only be because you chose it. If you're happy, it could only be because you chose it. If you're just indifferent, it can only be because you've chosen it. Even on the level of body-mind, you have the ability to choose again. And we, we start to learn to master choice on that conscious body-mind level and we're led ever deeper, ever deeper, ever deeper, ever deeper by the Holy Spirit into our mind where we can make the decision at the level of Christ's mind to undo the, level, the, the perception of separation, the desire to be special, the desire to have our own kingdom, and then we can rest in the truth that's been true the whole time. So that's this pathway, 100% responsibility. And egoic consciousness is rampant, rampant with victimhood. Later in one of these lessons, he'll call it the main booby prize of incarnating in this world was our desire to play with and become identified with victimhood. Now, if all that we've ever experienced is our own thing, you know, there's, there can be a lot of resistance to that egoically if you're invested with everyone else being guilty for it, but he's trying to put the power back in your hands and say the power of choice lies within you, not outside of you. The kingdom of heaven is within. And if you can master that choice, that's why it's called the way of mastery, not the way of randomness, not the way of any, meeny, miny, mo, not the way of chance, the way of mastery, Perfect peace only comes with mastery. It can't come any other way. Because even Yeshua has the choice for fear. We can't ever lose the choice for any infinite experience. It's a matter of mastering the choice that you want to have. So work with what you got at the level you think you're thinking at, at the level you think you're experiencing at, and allow the Holy Spirit to take you ever deeper, ever deeper, ever deeper. And as forgiveness happens and as healing happens, you'll be led deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into your mind where you can undo more and more and more and forgive more and more and more. And, you, you know, all this is practice, 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 practice. I asked him one time, how is it you're such a master? He said, practice, 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 practice. He said, I walked the world just as you did, I had to make the same choices you had to make. I had to choose to see Christ where before I was invested in someone else being wrong or being bad. 
And I had to master the choice to see each and every body, each and every circumstance as my Father saw it, as the voice for God told me to see it. So the more you do this, the more you get tuned in to that voice, the voice for love. And this voice, won't it'll meet you where you're at. You won't necessarily get the deepest, most esoteric teachings right off the bat when you've invited the Holy Spirit in because you know, you're just worried about apartment A or apartment B. You know, you're not really, you know, you just want to be a little bit happier. You're not really deeply ready to undo the whole thing. So love will meet you wherever you're at and guide you deeper, 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 deeper. We often make this mistake that we have to accomplish some level of awakening before we'll get help. The ego kind of tricks us into that. Well, I need to get my shit together before I can go to Jesus for help. Because we're kind of, the ego's like we're embarrassed or we're humiliated. That's all just another trap. Go where you are and say, I don't even know where I am. Jesus, just help me. You know, give me the Holy Spirit. Give me guidance on every decision I make. Whether it's, you know, fish or chicken on a menu, that doesn't matter. Every decision. And we're going to talk about this this Friday on a dialogue. So, mastery comes through practice. And I would suggest to you that I've seen it within my own consciousness and I've dealt with, sat with some of you that have expressed the frustration of having to continue to choose. Why does this keep coming up? Why does this keep coming up? Why does this keep coming up? Well, if you want mastery, maybe you might consider welcoming the opportunity to practice rather than resisting the fact that practice is there. If you embrace that that is part of your awakening process, be grateful to have the practice. Otherwise, you know, you know, you know, it's, if you're going to go run a marathon, or you're going to be a gymnast and you don't ever practice, I doubt you're going to get the gold. So be glad that you get the opportunities to practice. And those things that come up and we forgive them and they come up and we forgive them, they come up and we forgive them. Well, we only forgive what we're ready to forgive. We think we've forgiven at all, but if it's still coming up, it hasn't been completely forgiven. Because there's a much deeper attachment to it than you might think. So, keep practicing. Practice, 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 practice. It seems simple, doesn't it? Well, of course, okay. I'm creating my own experience. And yet, what soul has not known a resistance to this idea? If you bake a cake and it turns out well, you will say, I did that. But if you bake a cake and it turns out very bad, it must have been the flour. It must have been the temperature of the oven. Surely there was something that caused this creation to not be what I would truly desire. It takes great courage, great faith to look upon all your creations, your thoughts, your feelings, your manifestations with love and with the innocence of a child, to plant a garden and to have all things wither and die, and yet to smile and say, I planted this garden. I and I alone have done this. Well, I'll get a little hungry here, so I might as well go to the store. <laughs> you know, his teaching mastery, of course, started when he was on the planet, and he talked in very simple messages to very simple people giving parables that had a lot of depth to them. That could, you know, let those who have ears to hear, they could hear it at just the most body-mind level or all the way down to the deepest kind of spiritual teachings. And, you know, we can all relate to this. We love taking credit when things go well. And I don't know about you, but I had this habit of taking credit for things that I didn't even have anything to do about. But if somebody thought that I did... Then I, then I took credit for it, you know. How many of you have done that? You know, send, the house would look really clean that Cindy cleaned up, and somebody would come over and say, oh, you have such a beautiful house. And say, yeah, I did that, you know. Whatever that is, but we do that kind of thing because sometimes we're so desperate for approval, we're so desperate for recognition, we're so desperate for specialness, we'll take it no matter whose it is. <laughs> and, you know... But, but then we're kind of um, chintzy in how we hand it out. You know, have you ever noticed that too? We, we love to get compliments, but we're not always in gener as generous in giving them. Or we'll give one, and then it's like, okay, 
it's your turn to reciprocate. So I said, you look pretty. Now you have to say something nice about me. All of that is just this, you know, this <laughs> sick game that we play of egoic consciousness. And, you know, we all do this. We can relate to this. We don't need to look any further to go, oh, my gosh, I do that kind of thing all the time. And, of course, he's using a really obscure example about the cake. But everything, all of your creations, he gets to it later. This is what he does. He sets you up with a puffball to get you to laugh and go, oh, I can recognize that. And then here comes the zinger of, <laughs> of everything. Every thought, every feeling, every creation, all your manifestations. Can you look upon all of them with innocence and love? And look back in your life. Everything that you've got grievance about, everything that you've got judgments about, you've got all the practice you ever need to achieve mastery already within your current experience. If you can look upon each and every one of those creations and turn them all into innocence, turn them all into love, embrace them all, you've got all the practice you need. I mean, you're going to continue to get practice moment to moment to moment to moment to moment. But you've got, I mean, you've already developed. I mean, be proud of yourself. You've set the table for your awakening perfectly already, each and every one of you. Don't think all that stuff was bad and it's this burden to forgive. Rather, be great that you set the table so perfectly that you could master forgiveness. You can master looking upon all things with innocence. I mean, you can still look on it as a burden if you want, but I can suggest to you, if you go at it this way, you're going at it with gratitude because it has a value to you different than what you had placed on it when you judged it. And if you're willing to turn every one of those, uncover every one of those stones and turn all of that into love and forgiveness and peace, and gratitude, you're going to be well on your way to mastery. So how many of us here would, would welcome greater courage, greater faith to do that work? Great. Now the, the one thing I can feel a couple of you already feeling like overwhelmed, you don't do that work by yourself. You've got the Holy Spirit or Jesus or whoever your guide is to do that work with you. And remember, at the beginning of the lesson, he tells us it's their joy to join with us in this effort. What, what do you think is the greatest gift any teacher can give a student? When that student is an equal master. These masters, they take no greater joy than creating masters. Bringing you back to the recognition of your own mastery. You don't have to develop mastery before they let you come into like the master locker room. <laughs> They're happy to take you in there as apprentice and show you all the kingdom of heaven and say, this is your truth. We're just going to make you know, help you get rid of all the blocks to love's awareness, but we want you to know this is what your truth is. They're not trying to hide it from you, that you have to earn it. They're there to help. So please take your guide with you. And you can bring up anything in your past and ask Jesus or the Holy Spirit, I want to look on this situation about abandonment, whatever. That was my story. I want to look at this whole thing differently. And you know how many choices I got to make in looking at my whole lifetime story of abandonment? Every girlfriend that ever dumped me, everything that ever went bad, every I mean, I had thousands of opportunities to choose again. And of course, when you recognize I have this choice of guilt or peace, love or fear, as you're going through this process, you're mastering the choice now consciously, whereas before you made it unconsciously. So do you see how this is contributing to your awakening by developing your own mastery and you're developing discernment as you do that? So celebrate that process. That's the process of awakening. Rather than being pissed off about it, celebrate it. You know, use your eraser with joy. I was talking to somebody beforehand, and they were talking about how powerful this whole eraser technique was for them. You ready? Mm -hmm. Why is this important? Because the soul, a long time ago, began to create the perception that it was something other than it was created to be. 
and the voice for ego emerged within the garden of consciousness. And as the soul, as the deep mind that you have all known, and in fact are, that deep mind began to identify with a voice that was other than the voice for God. That voice has led you to believe that your creations determine your worthiness. Do you know that feeling? And therefore, if what you create is not up to, what is this word, snuff? Hmm, that's not up to snuff. That it means you, in the core of your beingness, are some kind of a failure. And I say unto you, in reality, failure is not even remotely possible. And why? If you plant a garden and the seed does not turn into the beautiful flower, it withers and dies, that experience is creation, and you have done it. And because all events in space and time, everything you experience, because these things are perfectly neutral, there is, in reality, never failure. How many of us have felt like a failure? Woohoo! But recognize in our dream of separation, that's the effect we were going for. So we man, we did it perfectly. Wouldn't we have to feel like a failure in a dream of separation? Wouldn't we have to perceive we've done it all wrong? Wouldn't we have to perceive enormous amounts of guilt? How well were you creating? You know, God created us to create. You were creating the whole time. But you were creating with a toolbox that was designed to create an experience of separation. We've created infinite toolboxes to have infinite kinds of experience across infinite dimensions. So recognize you mastered, you brought the mastery that you are already to body-mind and did it perfectly. You never failed at it. You did it perfectly. And you have the capacity within you to do that same level of perfection in love. Because you already have mastery. Do you recognize it? Do you see? If you can do Christ as well as you did body-mind, oh my gosh, you'll all be walking on water. Because didn't we all sink when we jumped in the water? Well, that's how great we did it. We weren't failing. That was the, that, so my point is I'm trying to get at is no mistakes have happened. If you're only getting the effects of your choices, you can't ever get other than what you chose. We all chose separation. Well, big deal. We wanted to try it. So we've tried it. We can choose again. You can't fail because the child of God only gets that which the child of God chooses. I mean, we even did this so well, we came up with concepts like randomness and happenstance and all kinds of things to say that accidents... I mean, can you imagine God creating accidentally? It's impossible. That's what He's trying to get at here. On the level of our Creator Self, we can't miscreate. We can perceive that we did, and didn't we all? By labeling it failure, by labeling it bad. So drop all that business that you ever failed at anything. You were always creating, and you were creating in the way you determined and set out to create. Be joyous that you have a Creator and a Father who says that gives us that level of liberty and the level of power and the inheritance to create so incredibly. So drop the whole idea that you ever did anything wrong. Take the level of mastery you already have and simply turn from fear as your creating toolbox to love. And why not? Why not? Nobody's kept track of your fear toolbox creations. Nobody has a list that you've got to you know, make everything right. All you need to do is lay down that toolbox and pick up the love toolbox. And know that within your being, with mastery that you already have, you can do love just as well.
You can listen to the voice for love just as accurately as we all for our whole life listen to the voice for fear. Isn't that cool? No mistakes have happened. Nothing's ever gone wrong. So he, he just he's pointing out in this first paragraph that deep in our mind, we began to create the perception. Not that the perception was forced on us. We created the perception that the soul was something other than it was created to be. We created it. Free will out of our own choice in order to have the experience. Because we're infinite beings and we're practicing having every infinite variation of experience that can be. That's how we know we're infinite. If we only had one kind of experience, well, that wouldn't be all possibilities, would it? So, we're just because we can. It's like having an ice cream factory that can make infinite flavors. Well, why not try them all? I mean, if you get stuck on just one, you don't know that the next five flavors might be 20 times better, you know? So that's all that's really happening here. And I love the way he, immer- he talks about the garden of our consciousness. It's a slight reference to the garden of Eden where into the garden crept the, the apple of right and wrong, good and bad, fear, love, duality, where it, what didn't exist before. So the whole dream of separation was this big revelatory aha. I mean, it was like kids on a playground and somebody had the, the idea of a new game to play. So we decided, well, sure, why not? Let's go do it. Because we can. And how well did we do it? So the voice that we created to tell us that we were not what we were, and we created it really effectively, um, started to say that we were unworthy, that our creations were bad. And of course, we believed that voice. Rather than realizing all we are is creators, We're just creating experience after experience after experience. Did I have an experience? Well, of course, then I was creating it. It's not bad until we label it bad. Once we label it bad, then we've judged it and want to cast it out of infinite possibilities and say that it shouldn't exist. You know, if God is all that is, except all that is, is all that is. All of it. Light, dark, and everything in between. The, I've used this analogy of the, the radio we talked about last time, the Holy Spirit channel and the ego. Well, God's all that is. It's the whole spectrum. But with mastery, we can pick any place on that spectrum we want to play. And if we're eternal beings, don't you want a lot of places to play? Jesus said when He walked the planet, my Father's house has many mansions, playgrounds, Well, let me tell you, you're in the playground of the body-mind right now. This isn't a mistake. It wasn't bad. It's not wrong. You're free to have even a happy dream experience in this dream of separation. Why not? Nobody's going to stop you. Nobody's going to say, whoa, you can't take responsibility for your thoughts. You can't be responsible for your feelings. The ego may try and tell you that, but... Nobody else can. So just accept. We were created to create, and we've been creating the whole time. And if you don't like the creations you've been creating, you don't need to beat yourself up for them. Just create a new. Those past creations have zero effect on you. Nobody having created fear for a million choices, the million and first choice, the choice for love is always there, is it not? Can you ever lose the choice for love? Can you ever lose the choice to choose? No. So use that power to create anew. The only failure occurs only within your own consciousness when you believe that it is not acceptable to receive and own and embrace your creation with love and with innocence. To look upon it, to experience it, to recognize your perfect safety in doing so. 
from where you can decide whether to continue in that form of creation or whether to think differently, to approach things differently. That is where the catch is. This is that the part of the mind has begun to teach you a long, long time ago what to accept as acceptable creations and what not, what to take responsibility for and what to deny responsibility for. And that conflict creates the illusion of separation. And when taken to its extreme, one discovers what you call your hospitals, full of those in deep depression, paranoia, and the feeling within the beingness, within the human mind, of feeling alienated and alone. I'll start at the bottom with alone. If you look at that very closely, it's all one. The clues are all over the dream. We didn't come in without leaving clues and symbols all over the place. But you put one space between the L and the, the one, alone becomes all one. And it's just a slight perception shift and it makes all the difference in the world. It's that simple a shift of perception. So the only failure within our consciousness was to not accept and embrace our creations. And I'm going to take you back to lesson number one where Yeshua said He chose the crucifixion. It wasn't done to Him. It was His choice. And what was He showing us? You can dream any dream you want to dream. You can dream even a dream of death. Boom! I'm back. It's no problem. Do you see? Nothing, nothing can, you can't lose anything. Nothing bad can happen. It's all okay. Play your hearts out, but there is no finality to the play. Because he looked upon it, he experienced it, he recognized his perfect safety as Christ that no event could take away his decision to choose and create anew. So he waited three days so no one would think you know, they would all believe the body had started to deteriorate so bad that it couldn't be reconstituted. He made a simple choice to create a new body to come back and say, look, do you guys see? You're all resurrected by your own choice. Your choice as Christ, which of course He was showing us. He had the power, and did He not say in lesson number one, His power of choice is exactly like our power of choice. No more powerful. I mean, this is powerful stuff. We're only in lesson two. There's 36 of these to go. So he's offering you, create differently. Create anew. Abandon all the beliefs that were in your fear toolbox that said this is a world of lack or scarcity or death or whatever else and allow all that to be erased out of your mind, erased out of your consciousness, and the Holy Spirit will bring the voice for love which will start to begin telling you the truths that are in alignment. What happens when you get in alignment with truth, in alignment with the voice for God? You've all experienced it when your life's just flowing along perfectly, you know? Everything's going well. Relationships are in order. You know, uh, athletes talk about being in the zone. Artists talk about being in the flow. When you're in that alignment, you're in the flow. You're not fighting anything. All of the universe is supporting you in the movement of your creation. Why not create that way? Give up resistance. And if you create something that you don't like, well, judging it doesn't help. Be grateful. Wow, I'm so glad I had that experience because now I know I'd rather not create that way again. If you resist it, how many of us have resisted a relationship only to have it come back again and again and again? And again, and it does come back until we embrace it in innocence and go, oh, I see. This pattern has nothing to do with the other bodies. I'm the common denominator. Let me approach that with innocence. Let me embrace that. Let me love myself for that creation. And then say, hmm, do I want to choose that way anymore? I'll forgive that, let it go, and I'll choose anew. But the choice comes here, not in a different partner out there. 
So we're creators, and we have full liberty to create, and we can just continue to do so in ever greater ways. So the, the whole contrast of good, bad, right, wrong, separation, union, all of that creates a really great context in which we master what it is we truly want. And would we really be able to choose if we didn't have things to tell us, ah, that's not the energy I like. That's not what I want to play with anymore. All that does is give you greater power and choice to choose what you do want. So again, nothing's bad. Nothing's worth being rejected. Not, you just When you choose chocolate over vanilla, you don't condemn vanilla when you choose separation over, or when you choose unity over separation, there's no need to condemn separation. Just stand in the truth that you choose. Move towards the choice you want rather than being pushed away from what you don't want. Does that make sense? Oftentimes the decisions we made are made on this fear level of what's the least bad thing I want to happen. And we confine our choices to that rather than what's the greatest thing that I could imagine I want to happen. So stop using fear, if you choose, as the motivator to, to be your propulsion and turn and let love be that which draws you to it in ever deeper ways. Because one, you're fighting you know, an illusion that doesn't even really exist, so you're giving it a reality, so it has to show up in your life to prove to you that it's real, or you can turn to love and let that reality start to pull you in that direction. So it's about choice for the positive, not choice against the negative. I think the greatest example of this I ever heard, someone asked Mother Teresa, we're having an anti-war rally, won't you come? And Mother Teresa said, no, thank you. And they're like, come on, you're this world leader. You're really important. You've got to be anti-war. And she said, if you have a peace rally, I'll come. Because for her, it wasn't about, it was only about love. It, it had nothing, I mean, fighting fire with fire doesn't help. Fighting the ego with more judgment doesn't help. Turn to love. And keep your eyes cast forward. That's what Jesus really meant on your creations that you want to create, not, not giving a pooty for whatever was behind you. And not letting the ego use time to burden you with all those past creations. You're free to bless them all. You know, you can forgiveness doesn't have to take long or be painful. It can be really joyful and be a pretty short process. How, how much are you willing to love the fact that you created? And be grateful that you have infinite ability to create and not judge yourself as failing in some way. It's your choice. But I think you can all sense there's a much better way to look about this whole awakening thing. And he makes this reference here, which you'll come back to in a couple other lessons, but that all of our illnesses, depression, sickness, everything else, we are creating those out of our choices to choose fear, to choose the sense that we're separate. But as I showed you with alone to all one, it's the slightest perceptual shift that makes all the difference in the world. And that perceptual shift hinges on nothing outside of you. It hinges on the power of choice, which you all already have. You may have been making it unconsciously for a long time, but you can see the effects that you're experiencing, and if you don't like the effects, you're getting another chance to choose again consciously. Will you choose to condemn that, or will you choose, wow, that was not an energy I really like. I'm glad I can do infinite energy, but I'm going to turn my attention this direction. So why not? Ready? Helplessness. Hopelessness, despair, anger, hatred, all of these are symptoms of a fundamental delusion that has occurred within the depth of the mind. It has occurred because there has been a long history of having cultivated the skill of listening to the wrong voice. The wrong voice is the voice of ego. It has taught you to judge. 
to pick, to select what you will be responsible for, the more you move into that consciousness, the harder it seems to ever hope for a chance of transcending the sense of separation and conflict and lack of peace. I'm going to jump in there, Cindy. Thank you. Who can join me in claiming mastery of helplessness, hopelessness, despair, anger, and hatred? Woohoo! So, can we all agree we've got that out of the way? Do we need any additional practice? Well, he goes on in the next line to say we've developed the skill of listening to the wrong voice. A honed, perfected skill. Not random, not by chance, not by anything other than our own choice to hone a skill to the level of mastery. So recognize the skill that you have as a creator has been being deployed like a surgeon's knife for fear and separation. It's been really precise. And it's been, it never, never, hardly, passes an invitation to judge. Does it not? I mean, don't we drive down the road and you judge one tree is pretty and another one is not? People walk by and it's like an instantaneous. There's judgment of attraction or not. There's attraction of like those shoes or not like those shoes. I mean, when you go shopping, it's this constant thing. That's how well we've honed the skill. And what was that skill designed to do? Separate. And who was the judger? The eye with the little dot, the separate eye. So we had a skill of listening to the voice for ego. We can take that same perfected skill and attach it to listening to Christ. Listening to the voice for Christ, the voice for love, the Holy Spirit, whatever name you want to put on it. So if you already have that skill, know that how well you've done it and deploy it in the other direction. But he's right. The more we've listened to it, the more po-pity we get, the more we hear, well, it can't be that easy. 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 Well, recognize how effectively you're creating with magnificent consistency. And when you do make the turn, you'll also hear with that level of consistency, this is easy, this is easy, this is easy. Now, this process in between of turning from one to the other can be as short or as long as you prefer because you're creating how that goes. But I'm just trying to relate to you that there's no guilt here. There's already an enormous skill set within the depth of your mind. Just repurpose it. In the Course in Miracles, he says purpose is really the only choice. Will you make the choice for love in all situations and all circumstances? Then he calls it the choiceless choice. So, if, you've, if it sounds like this will be a really, really hard thing for you to do, you may be a better master than everyone else in the room. The harder you think it is may really be an indication of how much more you've developed mastery with more consistency. Do you see what I mean? So, turn, just turn all that in the other direction. Okay. For how many of you have not known the feeling of resting your head upon the pillow at night and not being able to sleep because it's just not going the way you expected? The reason you cannot sleep is because you are in judgment of your creation. But it is possible to cultivate just the opposite in which to learn to look with perfect innocence upon all things that arise in that field that is your experience to look with innocence on what and what is called wonder at every feeling from the place of curiosity as you would look upon a cloud that passes through the sky look at it and marvel at it its shape its color when yeshua was working with me i'd mentioned last week about 
being conscious when you go to sleep and setting your mind in the right direction with intention and that and kind of guidance. Well, he was doing this thing, so we would do kind of this daily review. And I had the I didn't have to. I chose to do this. What a good Christ am I? Look at how deeply I chose to be pissed off today. Look at how deeply I chose to resent something that happened. Look at how deeply I feared this. Look at how what a good creator am I. And when he started putting that in those contexts, by taking ownership for it and saying, this is my creation and look at how well I did it, you, you start to recognize your level of creative power, but you're also going, well, of course, why would I choose that? Well, then, of course, the next logical step is, oh, wow, if I could take how well I did pissed off today and do love, joy, peace, happiness, the same well, wow, what a good Christ would I be. And not that one would be better or worse than the other, but you would still be in your choice. So are you following me? So if you're willing to do that, and he talks about it later in this pathway, about looking upon your creations, all of them. And then, you know, we move beyond our creations to all of creation. And we look upon everything that happens within the world and say, behold my creation. It is very, very good. Because isn't that what God said upon the creation of the Son? Look upon my creation. Love allows all things, trusts all things, embraces all things. Doesn't even need to evaluate them first. Doesn't need to judge their worthiness. It just loves, allows, embraces, and remains forever transcendent, which is this last thing about the clouds with sky, or the sky with clouds. This is one that's in all kinds of spirituality about the sky is never affected by the clouds that move through it. Your creative capacity as Christ is never affected by the, the ego clouds you created to run through your awareness. The sky's capacity to hold loving clouds was never diminished by all the tornadoes you created. You following me? Our power was never diminished and could never be lost. Ever. Ever. Eternity. It's just a matter of what do I want to create? So you've got to own the creations that we're making, which can be a, a kind of difficult thing. We would be vested in victimhood. We've been vested in God's will as somehow outside of us imposing something on us that we don't like. That's one of our favorites. You know, if it's God's will, I'll recover. You know, God's just applauding your ability to create the fact that you think you may or you may not cover. He's like, oh, which words are they going to choose? Either one's fine with God. It's your choice. So this learning to look with perfect innocence. And what would a kid do? When a kid, you know, you try and feed a kid peas, if the kid doesn't like it, spits out the peas. Doesn't run around to every kid in the neighborhood and get a little campaign going to outlaw peas. I mean, there's no need to condemn any of it. Just make the choice for the choice for what you want. Be glad that they're peas. And like them or not, your choice, no big deal. And he talked about developing this wonder. And when you really stop judging and you can look at the full spectrum of frequency, if you will, on the, on the, the radio station dial or on the infinite ability to create, you only need look around your room, look around your car, go outside and there is so many things to look in absolute innocent wonder at. And look on a tree and say, behold, this is my creation, and it is very, very good. And I have no idea how I did it. I have no idea, because it's not the body that's doing that, it's the Christ. But you have no idea how, how we do any of it. Does any of you know how anything gets created? I mean, I used to watch that show, How, how Stuff's Made. Has anybody watched that? I thought it was fascinating. But they only tell you how they took the raw materials and made something out of them. How did the raw materials get made? You can find wonder in everything. 
And if you've ever watched little kids asking questions, they ask profound, wonderful questions because they're curious. Can you look upon your experience as Christ moving through eternal creation with the curiosity that you're just exploring all potential options that are out there with the innocence of a child? How else would you go about it? I mean, I, I can assure you on the level of Christ, creation's not this big, serious thing. It's an expression of joy because there's no attachment to the actual creation. It's a toy that's created to play with and when you're finished with it, you put it down and you make another one. It's the joy of creating, which is where we're really in our joy. And anyone here who has any creative expression isn't that when time seems to stop for you? Isn't that when you stop thinking about bills next week or what happened? You are in the moment of creation. That is bliss. That is joy. That is happiness. That is peace. Can you imagine being in this world but not of it and walking through every moment of your experience in that state of being? whether it's as simple as drinking a cup of coffee because there's infinite mystery right there in your hand, how is that experience even arising? How many minds, how many people did it take to get the coffee from wherever the coffee was? I mean, this is another way to use your consciousness. If you want to stay in wonder, turn the curiosity of your consciousness on the mystery that is creation rather than standing in this indicting judgment about everything. And your mind will, can get to the point, and Richard and I were talking about this on the front porch, where it realizes at some point it can't understand. It can't know. And then the mind just becomes still, and there's the pure experience of being in whatever it is, whatever you're creating. The flow is there. And you don't need anything else. You have the ability to create this life to be like that. The happiest dream imaginable. So, how many of us have had trouble sleeping? And is it not all worry? What if? Pain, what if? Worry. And all of that is judging the creations and judging them unworthy. And what we don't recognize is when we do that, we automatically feel guilt because on some level we know we're condemning something that is God, that is our own creation. We're effectively you know, beating ourselves up for our own creation. And we feel guilty about that. Whether we project it on someone else or we turn the viciousness back on ourselves. So who can cultivate perfect innocence and do it as well as you've done incessant judgment? Can you just take the skill that you developed of mastery, pull out the filter of judgment, and drop in one of perfect innocence? Does it have to be any harder than that? You can make it really complicated and hard and take a long time and if so, you're really attached to that judgment filter. But it doesn't need to be any harder than that. That's how powerful our choice is. But we've conditioned ourselves to believe that our choices have hardly any power. So just that's one you can look at too. And each of your creations is exactly like this. It arises in the field of time and space. You experience it. And then it fades away. Every hurt that you have ever known is like a cloud that began to pass into the field of your awareness because you were perceiving things in a certain way. And if that hurt is still lodged within you, it is because you latched onto it. You followed the voice of ego, which caused you to believe that you are identifying with that feeling, with that perception. And because that's you, if you let go of it, what's going to happen? You might disappear. You might die. I'll start there. 
So if, if we think we're the clouds in the sky, if the clouds disappear and there's only clear sky, we think we're going to cease to exist. The clouds disappear, but you recognize, oh my gosh, I was the sky the whole time. I was just confused and believed I was the clouds. And when I was the clouds, of course, I was checking out every other cloud and thinking, my cloud's better than your cloud, or my cloud's not as big as that cloud. That cloud looks like a bunny. Mine doesn't. You know, we're doing all that kind of comparison stuff because we were misidentified with the form of the creation rather than the content of infinite Christed beingness that can create a sky that can create any number of cloud shapes. Infinite cloud shapes over and over and over and over. But I don't mean to underestimate this, but the ego will perceive itself dying. The cloud that believes that is all it is does perceive it will die when it's gone. Because... That's what we trained it to do. That's what we believed would happen. That's what we had to create with our fear toolbox, the idea that that going away would be death. Of course it's not, but that's not to say that that's not cultivated deep down in your mind. So I can make light of it here and we can laugh about it. When it comes up and you've got a very angry cloud that you think is you or that thinks it's going to die, You have the choice to remember, oh, I'm the sky. That cloud can go on and dissipate and die and nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. Each of your supposed other lifetimes, past, present, or future, are a cloud in your infinite sky. And we get caught in this trap of the perception of time. It's like you're the sky going... Oh, there were so pretty clouds 10 years ago. The clouds now just aren't as pretty. They suck. If it was 10 years ago, back in the good old days, you know, that's how we hold on to, you know, the past was better than now. Or, you know, we project pretty clouds out in the future. All of that is if we're attached to the form, not the content. The thoughts in the mind, not the vast, empty, infinite mind. I mean, there's symbol after symbol after symbol after this. The Buddhists use one of being the rock and seeing the river flow over it kind of thing. All kinds of different symbols around that. And the human mind then is that field within creation, within consciousness, that has learned to become so identified with perceptions and experiences and feelings that are not necessarily comfortable It believes that if it lets go of them, it will die. And so, from our perspective, as we would look upon your energy fields, those of you who are still identified within this dimension, it looks as though you are gripping, causing to condense energy, and your knuckles are white, trying to hold on to limitation and guilt, unworthiness and doubt. I just love that symbol that we're white-knuckling on, I am the tiniest cloud and I want to stay this way. This sky is going to kill me. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. I just want to be tiny. I just want to, I just want to rain a little bit. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I mean, Jesus in the Course of Miracles says we give up nothing to become everything. We give up the thought that we're a cloud to become the infinite sky that's eternal in which can have any number of experiences of clouds at whatever wish and the full power to do it. But our condensation around this fear and guilt, if I lose this identity that I have labeled as I, this separate one with the little dot, and the, if I lose that, I will cease to exist. Yes, that little separate I will cease to exist, but the big one will be left. That's what you'll recognize. Oh, I was the big one all the time playing like I was the small one. Whoa! Holy cow! And you'll just be in wonder how you ever pulled it off. 
how you could ever have deceived yourself so thoroughly and so completely. And you'll want to drop to your knees in infinitude to our Creator and just say, thank you, Father. Thank you for freedom on that level. Thank you for inheritance so great that can create so compellingly. Thank you, Father. And I know I can never lose that ability to create. And I recognize because I dreamt the dream of separation, I have perfect freedom. I can't ever lose anything. I can't ever lose the choice. The dream for separation is the proof of our freedom. It's the proof that God says yes to everything and judges nothing. How grateful can you be even now? Try it. Won't hurt you. Why not? Just try it. You would indeed seek innocence and peace. You would seek abundance and prosperity and joy. But often when you touch these things, it frightens you. And why? Because the truth of the kingdom requires openness, trust, expansiveness, spaciousness. It involves allowing, trusting, witnessing, letting things come and go, learning to cultivate a deep enjoyment of whatever arises, seeing that all things are just modifications of consciousness itself, and then letting them go when it's time for them to do so. And rest assured, there is no one not a single soul that has ever discovered something that was birthed in time that did not also end in time. And how much of your suffering comes because you are clinging to a lifeless past and insisting that you carry it with you still. And you are doing that because in that past you became identified with the clouds that were passing by, claiming that as your own identity. And therefore, if you release it, it will mean that you must change. You must go on. So how many of us have had this experience he's talking about of good things happening? I heard somebody mention it in the Course in Miracles group last week. They had like a week of everything going well, and they just became upset. Well, this something's got to, the other shoe's got to drop. Something's got to go wrong. It just can't be good. There can't be joy. There can't be happiness. How many people have gotten some recognition and then felt this paradoxical guilt about it? It's like you get some award or someone gives you credit for something, but yet we got to sneak in some sense of guilt or unworthiness almost right behind it. Or you go out and you buy something that the ego tells you you have to have and then immediately here comes buyer's remorse. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, gosh. After you had talked yourself into that was the thing you should do. So we really do fear even joy. Because on some level, we're, we've trained ourselves so well to be unworthy and not believe that it's worthy. Or that if it comes, don't expect it. Because as soon as you do, fate will rip it out of your hand. Now again, we're creating that experience, which of course we would need to to perpetuate this idea of loss and scarcity. But so many people want abundance. And if you listen to them talk, they're really denying it in their desire for it. You know, because we have this deep-seated sense of unworthiness. But the idea, the mind will let us play with the idea, I want it. But, 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 you know. So you ask for a dollar, but then there are ten buts after it that say, I don't deserve it. The universe adds that up. What, what does it get? I'm not worth it. So, you know, just look at that. Because so many of us feel like we're not worthy of joy, peace, prosperity, abundance. We seek it. So then he moves down to, this is all about allowing Trusting, witnessing, openness, expansiveness, spaciousness. Nowhere does it say control.
Love allows, trusts, embraces. You heard about enlightenment being accepting what is. The sky is not trying to control the clouds that come or go. So when I talked earlier about controlling your creations, the control that you have is over looking on them with innocence, looking on them with allowance, not judging. So, and cultivate a deep enjoyment for whatever arises. And, you know, I applaud Yeshua for getting out of the way so none of us had to try it, finding great enjoyment in being pinned on the cross. Because how cool, you know, uh, he's talked with me about it. How cool to have, to create that experience to be able to send such a compelling message into the dream that, look, no harm, no foul. I'm back. Everything's fine. Because what he was showing us, the thing that you have, the only thing that you need to bring with you from the past is the recognition that you have choice and you can never lose it. That's the power of the kingdom of heaven. You can't ever lose it. You don't need the consequence of any of your choices in the past. Just know in this moment you're absolutely free and sovereign to choose. You can choose peace. You can choose wonder, you can choose innocence, you can choose witnessing, you can choose allowing, or you can choose to be pissed off about whatever's happening. And nobody's creating that experience save you. And no matter how you've used the power of choice in creation, you can't lose it. You're free in the next moment to choose again. And I love the way he calls the past lifeless. Nothing's really there doesn't seem to change, let it go. Have any of you ever found your body in the past or in the future? I mean, can you throw your body to next week and catch up to it later? I mean, even if you want to look on the, the level of body-mind, life is right here, right now. It's the only place it ever is. The now is really all that exists. That's why so many Spiritual meditation and healing modalities focus on awareness of the body. Because you can't be aware of a sensation that was an hour ago, and you can't be aware of one that might come in the next hour. You can only be with what appears to be here right now. So let go of the whole concept of time, and you're well on your way. Because there's only things in the past that need to be forgiven if you believe there are things in the past that need to be forgiven. If you recognize it's lifeless, it's done, it's over, it can't affect my ability to choose sovereign right now, what's there to forgive? But if you need to change your mind about it, then use the eraser and change your mind about it. If you believe it's serious, then work with serious. It's okay. Again, he talks about the beautiful clouds passing where we get misidentified as the form and not the eternal con content. So we have to change and move on. But who will I be? Well, you'll be Christ creating a new experience, a new you, a new perception, a new whatever, a new reality. And I got a hint for you. You've been doing that through all eternity, and that's all you'll ever be doing. So you might as well start enjoying it. Why not now? But if you choose not to, that's okay. You can do it later. And creation, itself that flows from the mind of God, is an ongoingness forever. You will never cease to be. You will go on forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. You will go on forever exactly as you are now. Or you can allow the mind of God to flow through you, carrying you to ever greater expansiveness, deepening your awareness of the infinite 
loveliness of the power of the mind of God. You'll come to recognize in this pathway when Yeshua repeats Himself, He's doing it for a purpose. He's trying to make a point. He's saying, stop and let me get your attention. Forever and forever and forever. Do you hear me now? Eternity and forever and forever and forever. He's establishing your eternalness, certainly trying to, and then He's saying, oh, but you're free. You can go on as you are now, a body-mind on the eternal cycle of life and death, or, and many of us didn't even realize there was another choice. I mean, how grateful you should be that you've called into your awareness the recognition that there is a choice to get off the cycle. Applaud yourself for that creation in the midst of your fear creations. Because now you know. You can't blame anyone else. Or you can allow the mind of God to flow through you, carrying you to ever greater expansiveness forever and ever and ever. Enlightenment is a point at which you get it experientially, but it's not like eternity's done, forever doesn't stop. I will time the sense of time stops, but the creation continues. And it will across infinite creation. And wouldn't we want it? Would we really want it any other way? But we'll be playing with ever more expansive realms, ever more expansive experiences, ever more expansive, ever more loving, ever more joyful. Someone else or God will have the next woohoo idea and we'll birth another cosmos to go play. And it may look nothing like this one. Bodies may be all kinds of different crazy shapes. I mean, when you recognize if you're willing to allow your mind, just look around the world as it is now at how creative we've been as Christ to create all these different forms of life and even things that we say aren't life but are inanimate. That's just as much consciousness as anything else. Do you know how much fun we have doing this? And be willing to accept that on a level you're doing it all consciously. And Yeshua will talk about it later in this, in this pathway that within you lies the ability to create your own universe. You're kind of doing it now, but it's a really, really small one that's very, very limited. But the ability to create one, and if you look at this one, we collectively we had created this one with all its incredible beauty and incredible diversity. But we did it with a really tiny, tiny toolbox. Can you imagine what we could create with a bigger toolbox? And the size of the toolbox continues to get more, more infinite, more expansive, more creative. We got the best deal going. I don't know about you guys, but I love our Creator. It's the coolest thing. And if we'll just open and allow the mind of God to flow through us, all God wants us to do is give all of it infinite self to us. We all, well, what's God's will? What's God's will? And we always think of it on, in the level of form. Is it for me to take this job or that job? Well, God's will is unlimited forever. God's will for you is that you be unlimited forever. I wonder if you would just consider allowing God's will to express to you and through you. Why not give that a try? God doesn't have a will that you take one job or another. Those are all our crazy ideas of making God's will so tiny. God created us in His image, unlimited and eternal. Creators. Perfect creators. And by the way, we've all been doing our perfection perfectly. In the dream of separation. Well, we're free to judge it that way. And I appreciate that, cre that creation. Because there it is. Why not look on it with innocence and go, wow, we can even judge it. We created even judgment. Woohoo! Is that an energy we want to keep doing? So anyway, 
How much fun have we had with this deepening of lesson number two? I know I have felt some great healing in the room over this. We've never failed. We've never failed. We've never failed to create. How joyful can we know to be bringing to us a creation of our own to remind us we can create anew. We've never lost the ability to create. <clears throat> so Cindy, thank you. I appreciate your help keeping me in order and I have to be more diligent. And I saw a couple of typos. Mm -hmm. We'll need to fix those. So next week we'll continue the exploration of lesson number two. You create your own experience. So are you willing to lay your head on the pillow tonight and applaud yourself for co-creating this experience to bring you an ever greater awareness of the infinite potential that lies before you. And yet another reminder of your absolute perfect innocence for everything you ever created. Recognize that. You're co-creating this. Applaud yourself for loving yourself enough to bring a reminder of your truth of your innocence, of your eternalness to you. Is that an energy you would like to continue? <clears throat> would you like to hear the voice for God not necessarily have to come through this body, but you embody it? <gasps> How much fun might that be? I think I'll try that. So have fun with yourself. Love yourself. And love the creations that you've created. Love is the only thing that will heal them. Love is forgiveness because forgiveness is acceptance and release. It's responsibility, acknowledgement, and letting go. And have fun with doing that. Create an experience of forgiveness that's fun and lively. I can tell you it's easier to do when it's fun and lively. So any questions or comments tonight? I'll put the nose on because none of these answers are serious. Anyone? It looks like uh, no questions, so we don't need a camera, Gordon. Been asking for a guide or a spirit teacher to come through for me for years, and it ain't showed up. Really? How do you think you got in this room? You had a book last week with, with prayer uh, explanations about the uh, way of Ma or the, uh, the Aramaic Lord's Prayer that was enlightening you and giving you new perspectives? Where did that come from? I mean, it's working in our lives even if we don't hear a distinct voice in our minds. The fact that you're here has to be evidence that you've heard the voice for God. There's a whole planet of people out there who are so incredibly asleep that they don't have a clue that are nowhere near a spiritual path. You couldn't be in this room if you hadn't been guided. You wouldn't have had the Course in Miracles or any um, spiritual truth show up in your experience. You're welcome to continue to think, I don't have, no one's showing up. But if you look at the evidence in your own life, I think you'd have to challenge that. And I invite you to look at that and go, well, shit, how did the Course in Miracles show up in my life? How did I hear about one who wakes? How did I hear about this whole concept of forgiveness? Because forgiveness wasn't, you know, there are people out there who don't even really know about that. So it's happening in every one of our lives. It's so subtle, we very rarely acknowledge it. And for me, I mean, any of us, the deeper you get on the path, the closer we allow that guidance to come so close that we're willing to hear it in our own minds and we don't need a bodysuit to channel God to anyone. So the fact that you're here is proof that you're being guided. That some of those other things I mentioned, each and every one of us should recognize the grace that has already brought us to this level of awareness. Because we know and we see it in the world all the time, they're sleeping out there like comatose sleeping. They're suffering out there that has no idea about any of this. 
So I respect your, your perception and I honor it as your creation, but I'm just offering you there's probably another way to see it and some of the things that I'm, illu- that I'm illuminated may be an opportunity to look and go, you know what, maybe I got more help going on here than I recognized. Maybe it's just not showing up in the way I have said it should look, you know, with a big ball of light and Yeshua standing right in front of us. I'm not insinuating that's your wish, but many times that's what, the way we want it. And if it doesn't look like that, we tend to dismiss all the thoughts that come into our mind that say, I'm a loving, holy child of God. You think the ego tells you that? You think all the lessons that pop up in your mind that remind you to change the channel or that remind you about a course lesson? Whose voice do you think that is? That's the voice for God. That's the Holy Spirit making sure you know you have a choice. So there's way more of that going on within our consciousness than we know. I mentioned this at the course group the other night, and this is a beautiful thing. Hold on a second. And many of us hear the ego thought, and then we immediately hear the correction. Do we not? How many of us are experiencing this? We're identified with the ego thought, the cloud, and the sky comes right in and says, no, 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 you're not that, you're this. I don't know if you recognize it, but if you've gotten them that close, all you need to do is switch from identity with this voice to this one. You're hearing the voice for love. It's right there. It's that close. Why don't you recognize that's the voice of Christ? That's what I am, rather than this one that always needs to be corrected. When you identify with the second one, then you've gotten that close. This one will start to go away. So recognize you're the voice of correction, not the voice of ego. And if they're in your mind that close, Jesus says it's a tiny little gap. Know that that second voice is the voice for love. It is the voice for Christ. That's your true voice. That's your higher self. That's your guide speaking to you. But because it's, it's ego thought course lesson, you don't recognize what that voice really is and how close it is and how much you're hearing it. So I just point that out because it's subtle because we can run in parallel to the voice for God for a really long time trying to make this one go away because we're so identified with it rather than just taking the very small step across the threshold and identifying with the second voice and go, oh my God, it's been here for months, for years. And I kept thinking that this one had to be fixed rather than just accept that the truth is true. You don't need to fix what was never never real or never broken. So, anyway, just a couple good tips for you. If you want to use them, great. If not, that first voice will tell you that's all bullshit. It's not that easy. <laughs> okay, Mark. The, uh, the Aramaic, that were, which was translated in the King James as be ye perfect, is actually more accurately translated as be ye all embracing. There you go. And isn't that what Yeshua was just teaching us? All embracing. No need to judge, just embrace everything. Can you get it wrong if the only answer is yes? I mean, when I was doing this, love allows all things, trusts all things, embraces all things. I just said, Yeshua, I'm going to shorten that to yes. So all I had to do was say yes. And I actually turned it into Yeshua. So, you know, I walked around all the time. Yeshua, 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 Yeshua. That was just my way of abbreviating the truth and acknowledging that my guide was there with me in the yes every time. Because when you say yes to love, love of course says yes back. So again, I extend that tool, that trick, you're welcome to use it. It's copyrighted to Christ, so it's yours. Please use it abundantly or not, whichever you prefer. Any other questions? You know, I don't know about you guys, but I am so glad you're willing to have this creation because I am loving this. I'm having so much joy telling you and myself 
because there's no real separation, the truth of what we are, and doing it in a light way, in a way that's not heavy and not burdensome and not, you know, you got to go do a bunch of spiritual practice and all this crazy mumbo-jumbo. Just master the choice. And all I've done, if I can do anything, is just help you recognize places where you have a choice where you didn't recognize you did before and give you a simple symbol to help you begin to master that choice. Because you're all already masters. I come with Yeshua and a beautiful heavenly host of beings when I do this work. And I know many of you have felt that presence in your own experience and in your own life. The more you open to them, the closer they will come. And I remind you, it's their joy to co-create Christ's resurrection. Please don't diminish their joy. And I appreciate you not diminishing mine, but give them the opportunity to display that joy in joining with you in acknowledging you as the Christ that you are and always have been. They will celebrate your past creations. They won't judge them. They won't condemn them. They'll say, what a good Christ are you? What would you like to create now? How can I help? Would you like to create walking on, you know, bringing heaven to earth? Would you like to create consciously? Would you like to waken into Christ? They're happy to help you with that. We love you with an absolutely infinite love and an eternal perfect peace. And we're absolutely certain of the choice that you're making and the one that you will make. Because given enough time, we're all going to wear ourselves out. (laughs) You know, some of us get to it what appears to be sooner rather than later. Yeshua told me, you know, it wasn't that he was better than us, it's that he did worse quicker. Does that make sense? <laughs> so, with that, my beautiful... Oh, got a question? Um, I was reading this book. It was about as it is. And it's about this uh, a p- a person that went... He got enlightenment. But he said it was about... He said it, in, a, in a way, he said it was about more about giving up choice and just being with what is. That's basically how he said it. And I was wondering, how does that... See, I know we, I know we cre- create, well, I, I, I don't know, because I, I guess we're, we're all creating in this, in, in, this, in this plane. But I mean, is, we're all part of creation. But how does that relate to just, I mean, if we just can just give up and being, is, that's an, also a choice, just allowing what it is, right? That's the final choice. Then it becomes a choiceless choice. You do surrender choice. He inferred to that when you just allow and witness and you're with what is. That is the state of enlightenment. But many of us, not in the state of enlightenment, are caught up in choice and judgment. So He meets us where we're at. This is the second lesson in this pathway. He's meeting us where we're at. So He's using the choice that we believe we have to help us master the choice to choose again. And the choice you end up mastering in its ultimate sense is the choice to not choose. Because love doesn't require a choice to be true. Fear requires a choice to exist. So, he's right. The the guy who's reading that book is right. This is where this is leading us. But if we've been making lots and lots of choices for fear, it's a whole lot better to turn those choices to love than rather just saying, you're screwed, you don't have a choice. I mean, that would feel very defeating, would it not? And that's not what we're about. We want to teach you to master choice and then rest in the mastery of the choiceless choice. The choice for love which requires no action. Which is just receiving and allowing. So, yes and yes. (laughs) Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Anything else? So we love you. But to your point, Bob, you're welcome to jump right to the choiceless choice. The truth is true right now and in every moment. Enlightenment just is. It's all our beliefs that it's not that keep us from experiencing it. 
So you're welcome to wake up on lesson number two. You don't need the other 30. 34, thank you. You don't need to know math, apparently, either. <laughs> so, you know, my, ex my awakening experience was early in A Course in Miracles. I didn't have to finish all the, the, the course lessons before I was anointed as enlightenment eligible. <laughs> You're all enlightened right now. I'm just trying to help empty your mind and give you tools to empty your mind so that you realize that that truth has been true all along and point to it in fun ways. But you don't, it doesn't have to take long. It doesn't have to be hard because it is now and it already is. And if you're there, then just stay there. Stay in a place of non judgment, non resistance, and you will find, even if it doesn't seem that way at first, an incredible effervescent joy will arise out of that constant state of simply being. You're welcome to be the sky right now. And I know a couple of you are working on that very joyfully. So, But thank you for the question, Bob. But a teacher meets the student where they're at. Now, there's a lot of spirituality that dismisses what your experience is and just sits back and says, here's the truth in a couple of cryptic little things and kind of leaves you on your own. Well, this pathway and Yeshua's teachings have always been designed to meet each and every person where they're at and take them to enlightenment. Not to say, here's what it is and it seems so far out of your consciousness that you could never get there. So that's why when I open these things, use what's helpful for you. If you're beyond it, great. Throw it out. Nobody's asking you to climb back down the ladder and erase if you've already erased the eraser. So, um, anyway, with that, peace and good night. Oh, the love offering, the announcements. All of you watching online, you can go to onewhowakes.org. In the upper right-hand corner is a yellow Give button. You can click on that and make a donation there. Those of you who are here in person, there's a basket on the other side of the fireplace. Beautiful friend, thank you so much for watching. The way of mastery is truly indeed the pathway given to us by the Master Himself, Yeshua. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you're so moved to give a love offering, my family and I would joyfully welcome it. You can see there on the screen our website at onewhowakes.org. In the upper right-hand corner where that red arrow is, is a little Give button. If you click there, you'll be directed to PayPal, and you could put in a donation, and we would certainly appreciate it. Peace be with you.